Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gents, I'm going to stop pedaling this exercise bike because I'm on an exercise bike because I'll be huffing and puffing in a moment and we don't want that while making a video. Well, hey, this is how you take care of your time. Those of you who are sitting in front of a computer, this exercise bike cost me $135 and it's made by a company called Whisk. Uh, let me make sure of that name. Oh, <laughs> Wick, Rick, W-I-R-K. Okay, that's the name of the company. I got it on Amazon, and it is not bad. It does what it's supposed to do. It has a timer and all of that wonderful stuff, but the unique thing about it is it has a place for you to put a laptop computer and to strap it down so it doesn't fall or tip over okay so those of you who are sitting in front of the computer every day and you work out of your home it would behoove you to get such a bike so that you are not sitting in front of that computer and just chomping away and snacking all day and sitting on your anus you know what I'm saying just a suggestion is that a suggestion? It seems like you were trying to discriminate against us as a result of our overweightness. Uh, yeah, take it how you want it. All right. What is a bill of exceptions? Does anybody know what a bill of exceptions is? Uh-uh, you can't read ahead. Uh-uh, you got to keep up with the rest of the class. If you didn't know before I asked the question, then you should not be answering the question. It doesn't apply to you. This is the ones who know. And if you ain't one of them, you should be shutting up. That's right. Shut. You no, know, just close the mouth. There you go. Close the mouth. Put the lips together. And don't hum. Do not try to sing. Do not try to beep. Just sit up there and keep the mouth shut until the end of the video. Because you are not a participant in this video. Because you already admitted you didn't know anything. No, no, no. Because if you said you knew something and you didn't, that means you were a liar. So that's admittance. The absence of evidence is not actually the absence of evidence. Okay. What is a bill of exceptions? Exceptions. A formal statement in writing of the objections or exceptions taken by a party during a trial in the course of the decisions, rulings, and instructions by the trial judge stating the objection with the facts and circumstances on which it is founded and in order to arrest its accuracy signed and sealed by a judge the object being to put the controverted ruling and or decision upon the record for information for the appellate court. Bill of Exceptions. Okay, in equity practice, that's what we're concerned with, a formal written complaint in the nature of a petition addressed to the suitor of ch in chancery, to the chancellor or to a court of equity or a court having equitable jurisdiction showing the names of all the parties, stating the facts which make up the case and the complainant's allegations, averring that the acts disclosed are contrary to equity, and praying for the process or specific relief or for such relief as circumstances demand. Bills are said to be original, not original. Excuse me? I don't understand that. Bills are said to be original, not original. Uh, or in nature of original bills. They are original when the circumstances constituting the case are not already before the court and relief is demanded or the bill is titled for the subsidiary purpose. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to show you the example of a bill. Okay? Because you're not going to find too many bills in equity because remember you're looking to go into equity so you do it as a formal complaint okay so that's what we're gonna do that's what we're gonna talk about and we're gonna have little rod he's gonna do the talking see bill of exceptions this is the document we're gonna be reading from so everybody put your hats and follow along um, we'll put this up online it will be titled bill of exception okay so when we put it up online, you be prepared to have it read to you, okay? We're going to read it now. So after this, it'll be online later today. Can't promise you it's going to be online immediately. We're going to promise you it'll be online later today. And if it ain't online later today, then you're just going to have to sit your anus there and wait for it to be online. Ignorant mother... I'm sorry. I apologize. I ain't got enough sleep, y'all. And when I don't get enough sleep, it just gives me the behoobies. Behoobies? What's a behoobie? 
Well, a Bahubi is a, a, it's different from a Kahubi. And so the Bahubis and the Kahubis have been fighting for years because the Bahubis say that they were here first, but the Kahubis say that they were here first. But the Bahubis say our name starts with a B and your name starts with a C. And the Kahubi says, no, that's not the way it works. And Bahubi said, of course, that's the way it works. And the Bahubis and the Kahubis started fighting and drive by and shooting each other and, you know, carrying knives in school and everything. And so it, the war's been going on for centuries between the Bahubis and the Kahubis. That's what you get for asking a stupid question in the first place. Now, shall we continue? <sighs> Let's let Rod begin talking. Rod? Where are you, Rod? Ladies and gentlemen, I don't think Rod wants to come to the party. He didn't like the story about the Bahubis and the Kahubis. Poor Rod. In the Sandus County Superior Court in and for the great state of Sandy Beach Bill of Exceptions Preamble, whereas it has been held and as a matter of record that the parties have entered into a binding contractual agreement on or about October 22nd, 2018. He's going to finish with a contract involving commercial and commerce business and each party having waived unequivocally all immunities aside from their stipulated uh, from those stipulated within the agreement aforementioned all right that is very necessary that you state that at the very beginning that takes care of the sovereign immunity thing where the united states or any other government entity and or agency waives and it has the authority to do so their sovereign immunity now you must understand a school teacher cannot waive the sovereign immunity of the United States or of the state, nor can a police officer waive the sovereign immunity of the state or the United and States. And it is further held that the parties have agreed that the contract is binding in every forum and or proceeding related directly or indirectly to Richard Harrisburg to include any and all derivatives. Okay. As you see, this bill is written the same as a regular bill to Congress, and that's exactly how you're going to approach the court with your bill okay because this is an equity equity court equitable court works different from your regular court your so-called courts of law That's that the united states and the state of sandy beach in their official capacity have confessed to operating a commercial business and waiving any and all claims to sovereign immunity sorry i forgot where i was going because i was focusing on what he was saying but this is where you are documenting that they have waived their rights and are to be treated as any other corporation and going into equitable court is where you need to be. And so it the parties agreeing that, that each are consenting parties capable and able of entering into contract to sue and to be sued, neither suffering from a mental disease and or mental defect are bound by the terms and conditions of the agreement as they are irrevocable. Uh, it went too far, y'all. He's going to catch up to us. He, he's a little slow, okay? Don't y'all talk about him, okay? Because he, he was on the short bus, all right? For a long time. Come on, Rod. Now, getting back to the agreement and going into Chancery Court, you have to so title it, and you have to let them know there's a bill in Chancery, a bill in Equity. Okay, so let's take care of that now while Rod is taking his time catching back up with us. And the agreement included an arbitration clause, and as per the provisions of the Arbitration Act for the state of Sandy Beach, should the arbitration clause and or the contract be associated with commerce directly and or indirectly, the provisions of the Federal Arbitration Act would take precedent. Okay. The parties have agreed that the... Federal Arbitration Act, because it involves commerce, takes precedent. Remember, the Federal Arbitration Act is invoke any time money's commerce and the interference or engaging or entering into commerce is involved. So that automatically invokes the Federal Arbitration Act. You're just highlighting the same here. Basically, this and is the same after having agreed to the terms of the agreement that was binding upon all parties, the United States and the state of Sandy Beach did knowingly and intentionally violate the terms of the agreement by making claims and or challenges to the agreement outside the venue of arbitration, thus violating the arbitration clause and other provisions and terms as well as conditions of the binding contractual agreement coupled with interests. Okay. No, 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 let's, I don't want to do that right there.
let's do this right here. I don't want that capitalized, so let's get rid of all that all cap stuff. How you gonna do that? You gonna type it all over again? No, I'm gonna go up here and say the A's have it. You see that right there? Now to take care of that. All right, now got that taken care of. Let's move on. The thrill is gone. All right, so getting back to the motion to compel arbitration. This is basically the same information that's in that, just put in bill format. Okay. How do you know what a bill format is? Ladies and gentlemen, the reason why we know what a bill format is is because we did a video showing y'all about this. I'm just a bill, yes, I'm only a bill, and I got as far as Capitol Hill. Well, now, uh, okay, we'll do that. We'll do all of this stuff here later. Okay, that stuff will come later. Let's get rid of that. We don't need that. All of that titling stuff, that will come later. Right now, we're just doing the bill. It will be on there by the time time needs to be had. Okay? But see, we're and not that despite any presumption and door claim by the magistrate at Sanders County that courts of law do not recognize and or acknowledge arbitration agreements, either judicially or administratively, is disproved by the Supreme Court of the United States, where they held the following. We must not overlook this principal objective when construing the statute or allow the fortuitous impact of the act on efficient dispute resolution to overshadow the underlying motivation. Indeed. Okay. So, we'll take care of the style and everything later, but you all need to understand that everything you see from this point on, quotations, is what the actual courts have said, i.e., the Supreme Court of the United States, especially in 1934. Remember, contract law does not change. The principles of contract law does not change. Equity does not change. The principles of equity does not change. Now, however, the law and courts of law, those that junk changes all the time because they can amend it and change it all day long. But what they can't do is change equity. So as you see, bills of exception are the exception to the rule and are to be done in equity. If you have a matter that is at chancery, that's equity. If you have a matter for incarceration, you need to be in equity court with a bill of exception highlighting the facts. Indeed, this conclusion is compelled by the court's recent holding in Moses H. Cohn Memorial Hospital v. Mercury Construction Corporation, 460 U.S. 1, 1983, in which we affirmed an order requiring enforcement of an arbitration agreement, even though the arbitration would result in bifurcated proceedings. Now, what he means by bifurcated proceedings is that there might be a civil proceeding and a criminal proceeding okay however if there is an arbitration agreement the enforcement of the arbitration agreement pay attention the law requires the enforcement of an arbitrator arbitration agreement even though it may intertwine itself with other matters of other courts of other jurisdictions okay those are called pendant cases in other jurisdictions. So, yes. That misfortune, we noted, occurs because the relevant federal law requires piecemeal resolution when necessary to give effect to an arbitration agreement. Id. At 20. See also id. At 24-25, no, the Arbitration, the arbitration Act, Act establishes does. that, as a matter of federal law, any doubts concerning the scope of arbitrable issues should be resolved in favor of arbitration. In favor of arbitration. That's what we want. Like I said, Achilles Hill. Okay? Because they don't want to get rid of arbitration. They don't want to make it to where arbitration can be challenged. Because then that means the corporations, remember, they are a corporation. And they favor arbitration because they are a corporation. Will not be able to do arbitrations on a whim. It will clog up the entire process. Too bad. That's what they get for playing these stupid games. Okay? Because that's all that's going on here is a stupid game. They cannot have it both ways. We therefore are not persuaded by the argument that the conflict between two goals of the Arbitration Act enforcement of private agreements and encouragement of efficient and speedy dispute resolution must be resolved in favor of the latter in order to realize the intent of the drafters. Basically what they were saying is that some attorneys and judges were saying that the reason for the Arbitration Act was to help with the speedy disposition of cases and not so much with the sticking to the arbitration agreement. And that 
the arbitration agreements, some of them can take up to six months to a year, depending on delays, or not efficient. And so efficiency should come to play before um, the actual due process right to arbitration. Now remember, the arbitration agreement becomes property. Why? The contract is part of the contract, and it's a binding part The preeminent of the concern of Congress in passing the act was to enforce private agreements into which parties had entered, and that concern requires that we rigorously enforce agreements to arbitrate, even if the result is piecemeal litigation, at least absent the countervailing policy manifested in another federal statute. CN. 1. Supra. Okay. So, as you saw, even if it would result in a... By compelling conflict. arbitration of state law claims, a district court successfully protects the contractual rights of the parties and their rights under the Arbitration Act. They protect the contractual rights of the parties, okay, by enforcing the arbitration provisions. They protect the rights of the parties, the right to property being one of those rights. You get it? You got it? Good. Now, this is the part that they, he was just reading at. Um, that's uh, what about Bob? By compelling arbitration of state law claims. Even C. 470 federal, U.S. 213, 1985. I wish, I wish Bob Dean Witter Reynolds, Incorporated v. Birdno, 83 1708. United, uh, the Supreme Court of United States. Pay attention. I want you all to pay attention. There are two different Supreme Courts. We're going to change this to the. Okay, we're going to give it its proper name. So you have the United States Supreme Court, which is an administrative body, and they have the right to be administrative. They can be administrative. Supreme Court of the United States, suffice it to say that in framing preclusion rules in this context, courts shall take into account the federal interests warranting protection. Yeah, warranting protection. In other words, you can't have a contract which takes away rights from the federal government unless the federal government knowingly and intentionally waives those rights or respecting a party, but you cannot have the federal government violate the Constitution and or violate equity. It cannot violate equity, people. Equity always exists, even in a contract where there is As a no result, law. there is no reason to require that district courts decline to compel arbitration or manipulate the ordering of the resulting bifurcated proceedings, simply to avoid an infringement of federal interests. Arbitration being binding on all parties, you cannot force the government to violate the law. Your agreements must be in equity because equity always exists. When there is no law, there is equity. So contract is law and contracts must be equitable. Just follow that principle and you can go into equity. That's why we ask people not to change the contracts by much because... <sighs> They are fair, reasonable. Finding and persuasive the arguments advanced in support of the ruling below, we hold that the district court erred in refusing to grant the motion of Dean Witter to compel arbitration of the pendant state claims. That you should understand that the fact is you must have clean hands, the arbitration agreement and the contract must be fair, must be reasonable. We have kept with that premise and that's why we put the templates up there for you and told you just add the proof of claims you think should be accordingly we reverse the decision of the court of appeals insofar as it upheld the district court's denial of the motion to compel arbitration and we remand for further proceedings consistent with this opinion okay when the district court denied the motion okay the supreme court says uh, -uh not so fast buddy where you think you're going that wouldn't be prudent just simply wouldn't be prudent and they said, you cannot deny the motion to compel arbitration. There is an arbitration agreement, and that agreement was agreed to by both parties, and so you must grant the motion to compel arbitration. Doesn't matter if you have a pending case in your court. Doesn't matter if there is a civil trial scheduled. If there is an arbitration agreement, the arbitration agreement and the motion to compel arbitration takes precedent. That's what the Supreme and, Court And, in keeping with the spirit of the arbitration agreement as stipulated in the contract, the Arbitration Act has been fortified by the intentions of Congress to be placed on the same footing as other agreements. And when the government entered into an agreement waiving its sovereign capacity for which it and only it can do, it did so with the full knowledge and understanding of the consequences associated with such a waiver. Now that last part was added by me. 
okay? But when the government enters into a contract, it waives its sovereign immunity, and it is a competent adult, and it understands the consequences of waiving such immunity. You know what? I like the fact that Bob is taking his time, because it allows me to explain these paragraphs so that you get a better understanding. So I hope this is helping you. Okay, now, oh, the county of Sandesi? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know where Sandesi is, but I guess it was like, Baruba, Bahama, girl, I want to take you to Jamaica. Okay. What? Antigua, come on, pretty mama. Key Lago. What? You guys don't know about the Kokomo? Yeah, if they can make up a word like the Kokomo and everybody sit up there and try to call reservation agents to figure out how they can get to the Kokomo. <laughs> That's right. Everybody was sitting up there trying to figure out, can they take them to Sesame Street? Okay. And so I can make up a city called Sandesi. And that is testified by an officer of the corporation for the county of Sandus, that he operates as both a peace officer and a law enforcement officer, one in administrative capacity, the other a capacity in which he is an officer of government, admits by the W-9 form filed by that organization and the tax filings by the same organization to being a private corporation, conducting commercial business, whereby it has voluntarily waived sovereign capacity, stripping it of any immunity, and that would include the officers under its care. Ladies and gentlemen, there was an officer who got on the stand and testified that he operated as both a peace officer and a law enforcement officer. Now, a law enforcement officer is in administrative capacity. They do W-9, so that's why you do subpoenas for their W-9 form, for which they cannot refuse. That proves that they file taxes. Then you pull up their articles of incorporation. You pull up their company charter. They're going to fight you tooth and nail. But nope, sorry, the moment he said he was a peace officer, I'm now challenging that. I am now saying that because he has lied on the witness stand and because a peace officer has no standing because a peace officer can't testify in administrative capacity because that makes it no longer a criminal matter that converts it to civil a peace officer see as a law enforcement officer he's a private entity working for a private corporation he has no authority private corporations do not have a matter of right or to operate as a corporation representing the government they cannot represent the government so either he has falsely misrepresented that he worked for the government or he was false misrepresenting the fact that he was actually authorized by law to do what he was doing there is no law that allows a private organization to do anything that's why every arrest is made by an officer in his private capacity but if he lied and misrepresented who he was in the initial, in the onset, guess what? He loses all rights to proceed. That's called the forbidden fruit doctrine. If he violated the law in the and first instance, when this officer admits under oath of office, when an officer appears on the witness stand, he is under oath taken before the court, and the oath of the office for which he is employed as constituting a double for which there is no immunity for misrepresentations, and or laying on an official record, to utilizing a ruse in order to gain access or injury, he does so not on behalf or at the behest of government, but of a private organization. Sorry, I'll get rid of this now. So that's exactly what I was saying. If he works for a private organization, he has no special rights. As a matter of fact, that means he's wearing a uniform under false pretenses because he is coming or presenting himself as a peace officer. But as a law enforcement officer, he must be bonded. So you also demand a copy of their bonding information not just for the officer but for the organization for which he works and his registration number because that makes him a foreign agent to government so he must have a registration certificate I just had somebody tell me that the officers do not often know that they are supposed to have this that's not our problem we don't care about that your problem is you didn't know how to bring this information for in. government has no authority nor discretion for lying either to the public or to any private citizen as government is a fiduciary holding a public trust confined to the prohibitions associated with that public trust ladies and gentlemen do you know the government cannot lie i know i know i know they say they can lie and they can mislead and they, they can they have immunity nope sorry the government cannot lie to anyone it cannot lie to the citizens of a state because they hold a public trust meaning that they must be truthful with the citizens of that state government cannot lie under any circumstances so when they admit and that's why I asked the question have you ever lied before okay that's what that question is for I had an officer say he used a ruse I somebody showed me uh, transcripts where an officer said he used a ruse in order to gain access sorry I don't care if you are in the course of your so-called official duties. 
See, when they say and, official because release, of this public trust, directly associated with the minor slash infant estate, as the parties agreed to the existence of the minor infant estate slash trust as a condition and term of the contract that was coupled with interests, it was duty bound, that is the court, to recognize the chancery exclusive and inherent jurisdiction associated with such trust and door states, which it had agreed to such binding conditions as a party to the contract. That the officer, when he said he utilized a ruse, he admitted to lying and misleading people, and that he has a habit of doing this because looking at the transcripts, he says that he has done that on occasion. That means that he is a habitual liar and cannot be trusted. Now, some people will say, well, that doesn't mean that. That just means he's good at his job. Yes, but now that he's admitted to lying intentionally, how do we know he's not lying intentionally now? He can tell us anything because he's not under oath. Oh, you guys didn't know? By failing to recognize in order to invoke equity, either with or without a declaration, but in this case a declaration was present, it is guilty of trustee suntort and contempt of trust, contempt of contract, as well as contempt of the fair and impartial administration of justice. The reason why they have no immunity when they lie is because when he has that protection, he's protected commercially, he's protected through the administration. Those are administrative statutes. The Constitution does not protect an officer from lying. As a matter of fact, there is nothing embedded in the Constitution that permits an officer to lie. Do you know why they cannot lie? Because it's a violation of your due process rights. You see, they must be fair and unbiased. Look at the Sixth Amendment. Look at the Fifth Amendment. They must be fair and unbiased. And remember, no warrant shall issue unless upon probable cause. On facts. A lie is not a fact. A lie is a manipulation of the facts. It is contrary to facts. And, that is a matter of record the court through its judicial officer has stated before the open public that it does not have to recognize a trust agreement. The moment you bring up the infant estate, the moment you challenge jurisdiction, see, once jurisdiction is challenged, it must be proved. Do you notice that the courts are not proving jurisdiction? They're skating around it? and skirting around it, ladies and gentlemen, they can't do that. They must prove jurisdiction once their jurisdiction is challenged. You don't have to state how you're challenging or why you're challenging. The fact is, I'm challenging it. If they sit up there and ignore you, which they will, don't try to explain it to them. I'm not here to teach you the law. I'm not here to teach you right from wrong. I'm not here to teach you the maxims of equity. I'm just here to bring up the point and to let you figure out that you cannot get out of it. You can say anything. That is a matter of record. The court won't. has stated that it does not have to recognize a challenge to its presumed jurisdiction. You can say any of that junk you want. You can sit up here and use all the legalese words you want. However, none of it will act as a presumption of evidence to the contrary. Oh, excuse me, a preponderance, not presumption of evidence, but a preponderance of evidence to the contrary, for which you must present. Now they say, once you... Um, that is a matter of record, because testimony exists which covered the issues of the government entering into contract with individuals on a regular basis, and that, the Miranda warning, is in fact an indeed a contract ending with a phrase, do you agree? I actually had occasion to ask an officer about the Miranda rights. I asked him, did you know that that was a contract? I didn't do it immediately. I asked him, did he know the difference between a contract? Did you know what the basic meaning of a contract is? And he stated, yes. So then I asked him about the Miranda warnings. And I said, did you not know that that was a contract? He looked at me crazy. I said, does it not end with the phrase, do you understand the rights that I have just read to you? I.e. an agreement. Do you agree? Do you understand the rights that I've just read to you? That what the testimony was that the officer was told is quoted, I accept your offer, with full immunity, and without recourse, which constituted a conditional acceptance by an officer not of record, but of a privately held and owned corporation. Yes, see, when you say to them, I accept your offer, with full immunity and without recourse, you've just entered into a contract with that officer if he does not object. And of course he can't object because he's too stupid to know what you've just done. Yes, I'm saying it. I'm saying it because it's the truth. If they don't know that they are they need a registration card, then they're too stupid to realize the fact that they just offered you a contract. The Supreme Court knows it when they issued that Miranda thing. See, I asked the officer, I said, hey, Miranda? I said, did you mention anything about the right to speak or the right to religion or the right to petition for redress? You didn't mention any of that, did you? No. Okay, so then... 
you are offering a contract with limited rights. Allowing for the records of that privately owned and held corporation to be made public and used to prove the lack of jurisdiction and the violation of the terms of the agreement by that corporate body. Oh, by the way, you now get the challenge whether or not they're government at that point because he read you rights, offered you a contract. Uh, wait, we got it. We got to stop Bob. What about Bob? Uh, Bob? That gotta, failure of the court to recognize the basic. We, we got to We got to stop that basic principles of service. Hold on. We got it. We got to show this to y'all because y'all not going to get it. We can go all the way over here. This New Hampshire bill 1778. I want y'all to pay attention. have by their silence and failure to fully, fully, see that's the point, they're not telling you everything. When they tell you you have the right to remain silent, you have the right to speak to an attorney, you have a right to blah, 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 blah. When they're telling you that, they're not telling you when they say, do you understand the rights that I've just read to you and do you accept these rights? See, they're not saying full statements, they're just giving little glimpse of statements because they say you are supposed to know the law. You're supposed to know what your rights are. So when he offers you that, you can object. You can say, oh no, I'm sorry, what about the right to speak? What about the right to religion? Well, what about the right to due process? What about the right to a jury trial? Oh, you did mention jury trial. No, I don't want a jury trial. What about the right to a trial by jury? Because the Constitution doesn't recognize a jury trial, but it does recognize the right to a trial by jury of peers. So what about those rights? What about the right to be free from cruel and unusual punishment? Wait a minute. What about the right to be an American citizen and not a United States citizen? What about the right that I have under immunity? No, so I'll accept your offer with full immunity and without recourse. And if they continue, there you go, thank you. And I'll even say, you got 10 seconds to provide a response to my questions or the agreement is accepted as the condition stated. Just that simple. It really is that simple. Well, let me explain to you. Fully informed uh, people of the consequences arising out of the corporate offer to contract. He's a corporate officer. He's contracting with you. New Hampshire told all of you nobody is paying attention. I'm trying to yell it and scream it and holler from the rooftops. I'm trying to tell it from the mountaintop. I'm trying to tell it up on the mountain. I am trying to tell it from the sunrise to the sunset to the shining bright star that comes out of the east and not the north. Not the North Star. You guys who've been paying attention to that North Star, y'all don't get it. That ain't got nothing to do with God. The North Star is Satan and his wonderful minions. That's why he controls, well, he actually controls the king of the north and the king of the south. But remember, Jesus is the bright morning star. Where does that star come from, the morning star? Does it not come from the east? He and his father are always said to be coming from the east. Now, I said Jesus is the bright morning star didn't say Jehovah. Jehovah is always said to be coming from the east. That's why the temple was facing east and not west or north or south. Do you get it now? Now you understand why that is the case? So let's get back to this corporate offer to contract. They are contracting with you all the time. This is how you take care of their stupid contracts by going into equity. Bill of exception is a way of getting into equity. Okay? Now, the failure of the court to recognize the basic principles of service and that service of a party may not be, and that's what he's going to be talking about. Hold on. Principles of service and that service of the party may only be by consent unless there is a petition made by the party attempting service in writing with full notice to the opposing party of said petition, allowing five business days to respond to such notification. It is improper. What happens is they often like to hand you documents in court. Ladies and gentlemen, you're not required to take those documents. Say no, you will serve these in the due course like the rules require because I am not accepting service here. Just that simple. Just that simple. Well, why won't you? I don't need to explain why. I just need to tell you no. That the delivery of discovery without such being requested is a violation of due process, especially where there is no waiver of consent placed on any record. 
what, what they like to do is they like to present you all of those papers calling it discovery so that they can talk about it on the record saying that you've been served. No, they can't do that. It has to be five days notice before they can have any such discussion. And all you have to do is raise your objection. That's what you're doing with this. This is a bill of exceptions, notifying them of your objections. You don't have to explain nothing. That a party acting as counsel for a defendant and not self-representation, because self-representation as indicated by the judicial officer Roberts, is a violation of the right against involuntary servitude, as self-representation implies that one is representing the defendant that is agreeing that he or she is the defendant, when the judicial officer delayed the hearing without probable cause, and or any other showing on the record by more than 24 hours, he was in fact using portion arrest and direct of further deprivation of liberty to induce compliance to support the presumption and violation of the rights of the accused and or the person acting as counsel for the defendant. I'll have to come back to this. I don't know what that was about. So we're going to have to talk about that. Let's make that a heading. So I'll remember it and make you read and make you bold and make you under my line. And then put a strike through you. You're struck out because I got to remember um, what I was trying to say there, voice recognition. Basically, when you tell a judicial officer that, no, I am representing no one, I am speaking on my own behalf, and they get upset, and they get angry, and they want to delay things, then you get them for interfering with your due process rights because they need to have justification for any delays. Okay? Just that simple. That's duress, and I believe that's uh, using duress and direct Yeah, this is direct. That the defendant is a legal entity, a juristic person, a legal fiction, as defined in law, as each of the aforementioned terms are legal terminology, and or legally says agreed by the parties via the terms and conditions of the binding self-executing contract coupled with interests. Okay, that's how that's supposed to be. Duress and coercion, a further deprivation of liberty to induce compliance to support the presumption in violation of the rights of the accused or a person acting as counsel for the defendant. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what they do. And then when they do that, then they like to say anything you say can and will be used against you if you are representing the defendant. When you are speaking on your own behalf, you're not testifying. Nor can anything you say be used against you during those And if the defendant is a legal entity, a juristic person, a legal fiction, a ward of the court, the rights associated with such an entity are only by privilege. Because with everyone knows a right cannot be converted to a privilege, and no one has a right to be a legal entity, as such is only permissible through statute. Now, did you guys know that the so-called legal entity, the legal fiction, the juristic person as defined in law, and legal terminology and or legalese, is a quote-unquote non-human, non-person, non-natural entity. That the court and any judicial officers associated there too for the state of Sandy Beach and particularly the county of Sandus operate via conflict of interest in that they are parties of an ongoing conspiracy involving deprivation of rights, age, religious, political, and other disability discrimination, racism, and the denial of due process through such deprivation of rights inherent as well as alienable. What happens is the reason why a judis juristic person does not have any rights, does not retain any rights, he's not have does not have any inalienable rights. When the Supreme Court made that decision, they did not make that decision when they claim that corporations have rights. They were doing it administratively. Go back and look at the case. Because they could not have the rights inalienable and alienable as defined in the Constitution. Because corporations, even though the government is a corporation, was not construed in that. The government has no rights according to the Constitution. They only have a right to rule over the people, but they do not have the right to the same rights as the people. Okay, those are documenting and the And that valid contracts of, of the government. United States are property, and the rights of private individuals arising out of them are protected by the Fifth Amendment. You guys do know that your contracts are property? Just like the valid contracts of the United States are property, your contracts are property as well? 
That's why it says the rights of private individuals, not the privileges of private individuals. This is the Supreme Court. They're highlighting that individuals have rights under the contract. And this is what they're saying. The courts nor Congress can overstep those rights. Okay? That's what the Supreme Court was highlighting. That's why the document has to be fair. Come on now, Bob. Catch up to me. So... The courts have to be fair. P-292 U.S. 576-579. Your document, your contract has to be fair. It has to be, what would we say other than fair? It has to be workable, meaning that everything in the document, the parties have to be able to complete. That the U.S. Congress, the executive branch, and the courts are without the power to reduce, invalidate, or annul by repudiating and abrogating the contractual obligations of the United States. All of you must know that your contracts are just as binding as theirs, that it cannot be annulled just because they feel like it. The information and language of your contract is a protection for all sides, you and them, which makes it more binding than theirs because it is fair and reasonable because they can reasonably consent to those conditions and terms. And if they didn't want to consent to those conditions and terms, all they had to do was respond. P-292 U.S. 580. According to the terms of the agreement. Now, that consent to sue the United States government on a contract is indeed part of the obligation. Yes, the contract speaks about tort and how... That consent to sue the United States on a contract is indeed a part of the obligation of the contract which may not be impaired. It is a right accorded as a consequence of the waiver, the grant of a property right protected by the Fifth Amendment, and may not be withdrawn at any time. This is what the Supreme Court said in that particular case, that it is a property right protected under the Fifth Amendment that you do have the right to sue the United States when they're a party to the contract, and they're bound by the terms of the contract. Okay? So, the only problem is, you want to sue them in equitable court, i.e. a bill of equity, and going in with a bill of exception. See, that's why I said the Bill of Equity of Exceptions. Just that simple. Hit them, two birds, right hook, left hook. <sighs> Amazing. I'll probably P-292 have this U.S. 580. I'll probably have this uh, communication done by Friday. You know what the problem is? I got to get rid of all this um, because it is still a ways to go. Not a long ways. No, it's not a lot to go. See, look at that. It's not a lot to go. That's the second to the last paragraph. It's just, it's going to get through all these things right here, and that's going to be irritating. So hold on one second, y'all. No, this is that ding, what, I don't opened the wrong thing. I'm supposed to be right here. As the Why Fifth Amendment commands that property be not taken without making just compensation. Be not taken. That is, just, that is the court saying that, y'all. Valid contracts are property, whether the obligor be a private individual, a municipality, a state, or the United States. Come on now, straighten up. Uh-oh. We done messed up. We gotta go down now. Okay. Whew. Finally. Um, let's get back here. The Fifth Amendment commands that property not be not taken without making just compensation. This is the way the Supreme Court read it, y'all. It's a direct quote. Valid contracts are property whether the obligor rights the, against the United States arising out of a contract with it are protected by the Fifth Amendment. United States v. Central Pacific Art Company, 118 U.S. 235, 118 U.S. 238. United States v. Northern Pacific Rye Company, 256 U.S. 51, 256 U.S. 64, 256 U.S. 67. The unique thing and the most important thing about all of this, ladies and gentlemen, is the contracts are property. Whether the obligor be a private individual, you, a municipality, the state, government, agencies, you know, city, a state, or the United States. Valid contracts are property. Your contracts are property. That's why we gave you a copywritten number at the top. That's why you create your own copywritten number. 
and it can be a private copyright as long as you notify the other parties of the copyright, which is what you've done, which means that they cannot take that number and then utilize it. And when the United States it. enters into contract relations, its rights and duties therein are governed generally by the law applicable to contracts between private individuals. Ladies and gentlemen, when the United States enters into or engages in contractual relation, the rights and duties are governed generally by the law applicable to contracts by private individuals. Why? Because in order for the United States to enter into a contract, it must waive its sovereign immunity. Why? Because the sovereign has no obligation to enter into a contract with anybody. So in order for the sovereign, who is all powerful, to enter into a contract with somebody, it would have to give up certain rights. And in order for it to give up certain rights, it would have to waive those rights, i.e. equating to waiving sovereign immunity, which means that's why they get to be treated as any other private person or private corporation, because they're generally applicable under the law of contract between private individuals. Compare 40 U.S. Bank of the Metropolis, 15 pet. And we give you all of these cases that came directly from that case showing that the United States, when it enters into 377, 40 U.S. 392, the Floyd acceptances, seven wall. These binding agreements, these binding contracts, these commercial agreements, because remember, they are involving commerce, so they're entering into commercial business. They're to be treated as any other private corporation. Okay, the actual... Uh, doctrine says ordinary corporation, but all ordinary corporations are private corporations. Go back and take a look. A public corporation is not ordinary. And so when they engage in a contract... 666, 74 U.S. 675, Garrison v. United States, 7 Wall. They are acting not under the capacity of government. They are acting under the capacity of a private organization, a private entity private citizen just the way it is you know what we haven't heard the geese this morning there are a lot of geese you know you know from Charlie Brown there are a lot of geese all right just got to get this to catch up to us 688 74 us 690 smoots case 15 wall we're going to get rid of all that wall stuff. 36, because. 82 U.S. 47, Vermily V, Adams Express Company, 21 wall. 138, 88 U.S. 144, Cook V, United States, 91 U.S. 389, 91 U.S. 396, United States V, Smith, 94 U.S. 214, 94 U.S. 217, Hollerbach V, United Holler States, 233 U.S. 165, 233 U.S. 171. Reading Steel Casting Company v. United States. 268 U.S. 186. 268 U.S. 188. United States v. National Exchange Bank. 270 U.S. 527. 270 U.S. 534. Companies. Companies suing the United States. Companies suing the United States. That's why these are important people. I didn't see that at first until I took the time to sit back and let this play. But this is the United States versus Smith. Okay, United States versus Smith, and then you got Reading Steel Casting Company. Okay, but notice versus the United States, but I thought the United States is a sovereign. Well, it loses those sovereign rights when it enters into a contract with individuals. Thus, the wonderful case with Mr. Starks, they dismissed his motion to compel arbitration because they said that the attorney general was protected under sovereign immunity and that they couldn't waive the sovereign that the contract immunity. evidenced on the record and the subject matter is valid and is not questioned okay and they did not possess any sovereign uh, immunity because they had waived that sovereign immunity see the contract evidence on the record is subject is the subject matter, excuse me, on a record, on a record, and the subject matter is valid and is not questioned. Nobody's questioning the contract. Why? Do you know why they can't question the contract? Because they agreed to it. To question the contract, they would have to deal with the validity of the contract. Do you know who's the only person who can deal with the validity of a contract? The arbitrator. The arbitrator. The arbitrator. 
Oh my god, the Arbitrator is the only one who can deal with the value of a con- That's correct. The Arbitrator. Okay? The Arbitrator. You know what? I think that's about all that Bob has to do. And so, we're gonna cut this video- Uh oh, he's got one more big paragraph to read, y'all. That's the last paragraph right here. So let's see if we can get Bob to catch on up to us. Come on, Bob. As Congress had on? the power to authorize and the due process clause prohibits the United States from annulling them, and that the contract specifically involves a commercial transaction, whereby the United States, the Judicial Council for the State of Sandy Beach, the State of Sandy Beach through its Governor's Office, Secretary of State's Office, and Attorney. Hold on. It's gotta say General. Come on, Bob, what you waiting on? I think Bob wants us to keep him up front, up top. General's office have waived sovereign immunity as a result of entering into the contractual agreement, and thus does not fall within the scope, nor does it interfere with the policing power of government and its agencies. Compare lottery case, 188 U.S. 321, yeah, E. Blight Company V, United States, 220 U.S. 45, 220 U.S. 58, Hoke V, United States, 227 U.S. 308, He's 227 here, U.S. 323, oh, I think that's it. Hamilton v. Kentucky Distilleries and Warehouse Company, 250. Hold on, hold on, Rob, what you doing? Uh, Rod, excuse me, he, he just don't want to shut up. Okay, so, yeah, that's the end. So, we, 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 we done. So, that's what we were showing you is this information here. The contract specifically involves a commercial transaction whereby the United States the Judicial Council for the State of, you put that there, or the Administrative Office of the Court. Judicial Council and Administrative Office of the Court, same party. Uh, for the State of, and then the State of whatever it is, through the Governor's Office, the Secretary of State's Office, the Attorney General's Office, have waived sovereign immunity as a result of entering into the contractual agreement and thus does not fall within the scope, nor does it interfere with the policing power of government and or its agencies. These are the cases that says that the contract cannot infringe upon the policing powers of the government. However, when they waive their right, when they come in, they're not coming in as government. They're coming in as a private corporation for which they have no immunity. They've already waived that immunity. I hope you all are getting the nature of this video. If you're not getting it, then I can't help you. <sighs> but we're gonna do this and let you guys know this is gonna be the title. It's gonna be associated with uh, having waived sovereign immunity because this is a bill of equity at Chancery. So this is what you all need to know. Okay? Got it? Good. So I'm so glad we had this time together. And this particular document will be up. You will be able to take it and do it as you please. Okay? It'll be up under the same provisions of the Arbitration Act. Now, again, what we're doing here is we must show this to you because some of y'all ain't going to get it. I don't think this is it right here. This ain't it. That's not it. I think this is it right here. Is that it? No, that's not it. Bill of Exceptions, right here. This is where we need to be, okay? Now, let's go up here to the Bill of Exceptions so that you all know what's going on with the Bill of Exceptions because y'all, I know y'all still ain't getting it. Okay, what is a Bill of exception? See, now you can answer, but most of you going to be wrong because you still ain't got it. It's a formal statement of your objections or exceptions on the record where you list, hey, the judge said this, the judge said that, the judge said this, the judge was wrong, and you put your evidence to the fact that they were wrong. Well, we just provided a preponderance of evidence to the contrary, because we provided the decisions of the court, as opposed to the judge's own opening and closing their mouth. Okay, it's a statement objecting with facts and circumstances in which it is founded, and in order to attest its accuracy, signed and sealed by the judge. In order to attest its accuracy, signed and sealed by the judge, the object being to put the controverted ruling or decision upon the record for information for the appellate court. However, we got that. Do you understand? You can do a bill of equity in that court, but then we can also do a bill of equity in the chancery court. It says, in equity, a practice. This is a practice, everybody. A formal written complaint in the nature of a petition addressed to the suitor 
I mean, excuse me, by a suitor, you, in chancery, to the chancellor, or to a court of equity, or a court having equitable jurisdiction, showing the names of the parties, stating the facts, which make up the case and the complainant's allegations, veering that the acts disclosed are contrary to equity, and praying for purpose, process, or specific relief, and for such relief as the circumstances demand. And there's your case law for it. Okay? This won't change because equity, equity is foundational. Oh, we even have a California case. Oh, that is so dimple, that is so tweet. But, oh, most of them are California. Yes, um, yeah. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, like, well, I've already told you time and time again that everything starts in California. Everything gets tested in California. Why is that? I don't know. Why California is so important to these idiots? I don't know. But now you know. So we're going to bring this video to an end. Uh, we already told you what we're going to call it. Now you know that it deals with equity. Now you understand. I hope you understand. We're going to let y'all go. Have a coconut smile. We'll see y'all later. Adios, y'all. Goodbye.